Well, welcome students. Um, so hopefully you got a good idea from that first video um, what protein synthesis is a little bit about. Um, and he kind of gave some, some good explanations as to what this process is. Sometimes we refer to it as central dogma. And here's kind of a quick um, uh, summary of kind of what that was. And so we know that to make proteins, we first have to start out with DNA. And DNA, of course, is double-stranded, but we can kind of open that up or unzip it, if you will, and use the template to um, transcribe that into RNA, um, specifically into mRNA. Um, and mRNA, of course, is made up of nucleotides just like DNA. Um, the real difference is that there's um, U's instead of T's like we actually find in DNA. But regardless, we can have these triplets of RNA, which then are codons, which then are translated into amino acids. And a whole bunch of amino acids make up what we refer to as a protein. And so this is kind of the process of protein synthesis as a whole. But for today, we're going to be kind of going step by step through one particular piece of DNA that then codes for um, a particular protein and walking through that. So, Let's begin with um, the particular enzyme that we're going to make or protein, and that is Rubisco. And Rubisco is, um, as you can see here, the most abundant protein on Earth. It is the, the one protein that is responsible for, if you refer to it as fixing atmospheric carbon dioxide into our UBP, which is part of photosynthesis. And we're gonna be learning a course about that um, in about a week or so. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea that this is a very, very important protein and there's lots of it um, on Earth. And so it has to have come from somewhere. And of course, the instructions for it are in DNA. And you can see at the bottom of the screen is a kind of partial sequence um, of Rubisco or the, the gene that codes for Rubisco. And so that will represent the template DNA um, that has the gene coding for this particular protein. And so that's what we're going to be working with today. And so the first thing for us to remember is that, of course, DNA is double-stranded. And right here, as I mentioned, we only have the template strand. So if we are going to actually make the opposing one, which we already know is called the coding strand, we just use Chargaff's rule. And so if we see that at this 3' prime end that we're actually going to manufacture it in this 5 to 3' prime direction, then we would say, well, we know that a G actually matches with a C. And if we know that an A matches with a T and a C matches with a G, we can kind of continue to make all these pieces because we know of these relationships. And we know, of course, that it's anti-parallel, which is the reason why we're always building in that five to three prime direction. So we can just start building it and building it, knowing that there are these relationships. And so we then have our two different strands. If we're actually making more DNA, we have our template strand, and then we have our coding strand. But of course, notice that what we have here is two strands of DNA that come together to make one DNA molecule. And so this is just kind of um, re-cementing the things that we've already learned a little bit about the structure of DNA. So if we then kind of think about, well, this is the DNA that we were given that is, is coding for this particular protein. If we actually just go upstream of this, um, we can actually find an, another pretty interesting um, piece of this DNA, which is referred to as the promoter. And so this is kind of upstream of it. As you see, we're just kind of going um, the opposite direction of that, and we're actually looking for, um, and so we actually took the opposing piece, or we're looking on the coding strand in this particular case. And so the promoter is simply just a sequence of DNA on the coding strand. And it is specifically where this RNA polymerase, which again is a, a different enzyme, comes in and attaches to the DNA. And it's the molecule that's actually bringing all the nucleotides to match them using Chargaff's rule to then make RNA. And so that sequence is very, very important because it initiates this, um, this uh, process of transcription. And of course, it also sets the reading frame so that when we get that sequence, which we saw the original one was in black, and this is, of course, the coding sequence. But if we have the template, we've already started looking at triplets from there. And so that's kind of where we can begin from. And so again, this is where we started out. We had our template strand and our coding strand. And so if we then have the template and we're going to go ahead and say, okay, we have our RNA polymerase, it's going to attach because we know that upstream there was that promoter, it's going to start reading all of these things, and it's going to start manufacturing or adding in these nucleotides um, to make this RNA molecule. 
And of course, we remembered the difference between DNA and RNA is, of course, that there are these um, T's in DNA and U's in RNA and all the other nucleotides are exactly the same. The A's, the G's, and the C's are identical between the two different types of molecules. And so as we start to then build this RNA molecule, we can clearly see that it is um, a little bit different because it does have U's and it has no T's, but you should see that it's very, very similar to that coding strand. Of course, the only differences are those T's, but otherwise it's virtually identical, which is the reason why that DNA coding strand is called the coding strand, because it has the code, which is then carried through to the RNA. And this process of going from DNA to RNA, as we know, is already called, is called transcription. And so once we've done that, and we now have our DNA molecule, we can kind of begin to the next process. And this next step could be different depending upon if the organism was a prokaryote um, or a eukaryote, because we know that eukaryotes have these membrane-bound um, organelles, and specifically the nucleus, where all this DNA would be kept, would be one of them. And so if we have this um, particular uh, RNA molecule that was manufactured, and it is a eukaryote, so it, it does have um, a membrane-bound nucleus where it's kept, it can do some of this interesting processing. And so the first step of processing that could happen is it could add this cap and a tail. And these are just extra pieces of RNA that are added. Um, and those are useful because they can use them um, for protection so that when the um, RNA goes into the cytoplasm, it doesn't get kind of chewed on by other organisms. And it's also good for recognition by the ribosomes as it gets onto that step later on. In addition, um, there are pieces of that RNA transcript which are referred to as introns, and those are kind of pieces that are not used or they're not um, translated later on, and so they simply just get spliced out. Um, and then the remaining pieces, which are called exons because they're expressed, are actually spliced together. And so we actually can um, get this uh, new um, transcript that is um, from the original one, and we can actually slice and dice it in different ways to kind of get different final mRNAs that then can actually leave the nucleus. And so once, once again, we have this RNA processing, we leave uh, the nucleus, we go into the cytoplasm, of course, we're for a eukaryote. Then the ribosome actually finds the mRNA with the help of the cap and the tail. Um, it reads it, matches the codons to tRNA. The tRNA is, of course, attached to the appropriate amino acids, and our protein gets built. So let's talk um, in detail about how that process works using um, that original gene that we had of um, uh, Rubisco. So now we have this um, RNA transcript, and we of course know it is RNA because there's those U's there, and we're going to bring back into play this codon table that you learned a little bit about last time. And we're going to go ahead and use that codon table to understand what this RNA transcript is going to transcribe into in terms of amino acids. So we're going to um, look at it in terms of triplets. We can see that first triplet is GAC, so we can first take the G is the first base right here. The second base is along the top, so we can go all the way over to the A. And then the third one is right here, so there's the GAC, which is our spartic acid, which would be that first one. The second triplet is CAC, and so of course the first base right here is C. The second base, we go all the way over to the A over here, and there's the C, which of course is histidine. The next one is AAU. Again, here's the first base, here's the second base, there's the third one. And then we have to split the gaps. I had only kind of split these into groups of 10 for, for visual appearances, and so we can kind of just kind of keep going from there. And of course, this process is known as translation. But the real crux is to kind of go back to some of those things we talked a little bit about as to what are these um, different uh, types of amino acids. And so we kind of have already kind of coded for these different amino acids, but the real crux to remember is, is where's the start sequence? Because without a start sequence, you actually have not started to make a protein yet. And so if we go back to the very, very original DNA that we were provided, if we're kind of looking at for our start sequence in DNA, we know that it's actually AUG in terms of RNA, and so we have to look at the opposite to look for DNA, which of course the opposite of A is T, the opposite of U is A, and the opposite of G is going to be C, so it's TAC. And so we go along and look for it, there it is. There is of course our first um, sequence that is methionine, so that is actually where we're going to start. And so all these other pieces that we already kind of went through 
are kind of nonsense. They don't really mean anything until you reach a start sequence, which doesn't occur until right here. And so that's actually where our protein begins, is it starts at the start sequence. And it will keep going and build with all these different amino acids until it finally reaches our first stop sequence, which you can see right here. And of course, this does not code for an amino acid. It simply codes for stop. And so here is the list of all of the amino acids that it codes for starting here, because all this is meaningless before start, and the first stop occurs there, and there it is. And so just to kind of highlight a few interesting things um, about this, uh, first and foremost, um, we know that they are all going to start with methionine. Um, but the other thing is, is that if we look at the 20 different amino acids that do occur, um, there's actually about 10 of those that we as humans cannot actually produce um, on our own. And so we actually have to obtain those through our diet. And so valanine is one of those examples. And you can actually see that there are um, three valanines in this particular um, example that we have shown here. Um, in addition, another kind of interesting uh, fun fact, if you will, is if you looked at all the 20 different amino acids, there's only two of them that contain sulfur. And of course, we know that a lot of them are going to be containing these kind of uh, consistent things like nitrogen and carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. But sulfur is this very, very unique piece um, to uh, just two different types of amino acids. And cytosine doesn't actually occur um, in this particular sequence that we've uh, produced of amino acids, but methionine does actually contain one of those sulfurs, and so we can see that. Um, another interesting thing that you may want to do, and you'll probably be doing as part of this class, is counting the number of amino acids that's in your polypeptide. Um, and so remember when you do that, that of course that start sequence coded for methionine, and so that actually is an amino acid, so you're going to count that. So you would count one, two, three, four, and you keep going until you get all the way to 27 here. And a lot of students hesitate for this one, and you can see from your codon table that it codes for a stop, but not an amino acid. So in this particular case, this one is, is the polypeptide is only 27 amino acids long. And so that's kind of going through step by step using the example of Rubisco as our final protein product in the end, which we can see here is the polypeptide of amino acids for it. Of course, that came from um, our RNA, which then it came originally from our template strand of DNA, and that is the process of protein synthesis.